I'm going to call this Assembly Lands, Housing, and Economic Development Committee to order on February 17th at 12.15 p.m. Mr. Bryson, would you like to give the land acknowledgement? Uh, thank you, Ms. hughes Candies. Absolutely. Uh, we would like to acknowledge that the city and borough of Juneau is on Clinkett land and wish to honor the indigenous people of this land. For more than 10,000 years, Alaska Native people have been and continue to be integral to the well-being of our community. We are grateful to be in this place, a part of this community, and to honor the cultural, culture, traditions, and resilience of the Clinkett people. Gunnel Sheesh. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. Ms. Stuckworth, would you please note the roll? Assembly Member Bryson. Present. Assembly Member Wall. Present. Uh, Assembly Member Wall Hikadok is absent. Chair Hughes Scandies. Here. And we have liaisons Cole Etheridge and Mr. Myrtle. Thank you, Ms. Duckworth. Okay, so moving on to the approval of the agenda. Mr. Blydorn, did you have something on that? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to remove the two standing committee topics. Uh, those are generally on our regular scheduled meetings, but given that this is a work session on housing, um, I accidentally left them on the agenda. And then, um, Roxy, just so you know, the screen still says stream starting soon. So uh, those are my proposed agenda changes, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Blydorn. Any objection to that? The, seeing that, the agenda is approved. With those amendments, moving on to approval of minutes. Any uh, requested changes to the minutes? Seeing none, the minutes are accepted, which brings us to agenda topics. And we have a couple of action items at the top of this. And I am will turn to Mr. Blydorn uh, next for some information about the lease request. But I just want to remind members that this will come back to us at the assembly level. So if you have uh, deeper concerns, let's maybe not get sidetracked since this is a work session and maybe just use this time to get what questions answered we need from staff. So Mr. Blydorn, uh, I ride Alaska lease request, take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna uh, share my screen here really quickly just to give you an idea of where this is located. Sorry, I didn't include a map in the packet. Um, so you can see the red circle out here is out North Douglas Highway. It's actually West Douglas. And so it's hard to see on this image here on the screen, but you can see that there's actually uh, a path through this property here. It's the West Douglas Pioneer Road. It was completed in 2018 and it was developed as a future development access corridor to city property. This actually isn't a trail. It isn't a road. It's more of like driveway access to city property. And so uh, there was some funding available that allowed this to happen. And so since 2018, when it was completed, obviously the last uh, few years have been a blur. And over that time, we've had some recreational uses on it. We allow the Nordic Ski Club, they have a permit to uh, groom the trail in the winter and they pick alders off the road as they come up. And then we have had a few uh, races that have used the property as well for weekends. It's a kind of a safe spot to do that. And then in the summertime, we have some um, personal firewood harvesting out there. So when trees fall or if people need to collect firewood, this location has kind of alleviated the pressure off of other city property where people in the past have illegally harvested firewood. Uh, allowing this to be available for, uh, for those permits has um, given us the opportunity to give those folks some place to go. And so now at this point in time, in November, we received an, applicant, an application from iRide Alaska and this first came in and we kind of struggled with the applicant to figure out how to place this and how to how to see how to get it through city code. And we looked at some similar agreements that they have with Eagle Crest and with Parks and Rec. But in the end, we determined that given the status of this property as the uh, future development access corridor and the fact that it's not a trail, the fact that it's city property and not a right of way, it kind of led us into this lease, uh, lease section of code. And so, um, at this point in time, the first step in the process is for the assembly to provide a motion of support to work with the original proposer, just as we do with any leases or negotiated sales. And so we're here today just bringing this item up as a topic. And then I understand there are some questions and concerns, but uh, in the memo, I did request a motion of support to forward this to the assembly uh, to work with the original proposer under 5309-260. 
and I'll gladly answer any questions. Also, the applicant is here as well to answer questions as well. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Blinorn. Questions from the committee, Mr. Bryson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I need to declare a potential conflict. I have a business that rents uh, bikes, uh, e-bikes, and uh, cross-country skiing equipment. Um, however, I don't believe that uh, there's financial incentive for me, and I don't think that it will cause a, a conflict for me, but I wanted to declare it. All right. Thank you for putting that on the record, Mr. Bryson. I'm not seeing any reason that you can't participate. Um, Ms. Wall, did you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I understand that this is not a uh, trail and it's not technically managed by Parks and Rec, um, but certainly I think the public that uses it currently treats it as a trail and thinks of it as a trail in a recreational area. I, I spend a lot of time on this area and I always see people out with their dogs or on their bikes or their skis. Um, and so, you know, what would it take to have this managed? Um, it, you know, is there a way that we can manage this like we would the rainforest trail permit? You know, it, would it be a similar process to how Parks and Rec manages um, opportunities like this? So, you know, what things are being weighed, et cetera? Through the chair. That's a great question. My first response to this application was to treat it exactly like the rainforest trail, in which case it wouldn't need assembly approval. And so the likelihood of that happening is low because Parks has stated that they don't manage this property and um, it's just not in their budget, in their, it's not in their wheelhouse right now. And so, um, but maybe Chris Myrtle might have a comment on that as well. I see him maybe shaking his head yes or no. And so, um, yeah, originally we were trying to make this fit in similar to the existing agreements that the applicant has with other city entities. But um, given the management of this property and the development pass and the fact that it's, you know, the way it currently exists as a property, this was this was the direction we were encouraged to take it was it was a lease. And then um, if I might add, uh, at this point in time, we don't have authority to negotiate with the applicant, but I can see addressing some concerns of the assembly through the lease process and making it something like we did with uh, Deckhand Dave or Juno Compost where we had a one year term so that we would kind of saw how it went with renewals after that. Uh, follow up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Blyden for that. Um, so just, you know, in terms of the opportunities we have through the lease negotiation. So in the case of Rainforest Trail, as an example, are there limitations that that Parks and Rec put on this permit in terms of um, how many uh, tours a day, how many people, that type of of thing, um, and, and is that something that we would be able, or someone would be able to um, limit through this process? Mr. Blyden. Uh Thank you for that question as well. I have seen those agreements. I don't I haven't. I don't have them in front of me. And so, yeah, I think any of those things could be worked out in the lease. And then um, the applicant might be able to speak a little bit to what they have at the other locations of city property as well. Okay, Mr. Bryson. Uh, I'd love to hear from the applicants on what they have, the way they're set up in other areas and how they foresee this project going. And they could maybe address a little bit of Miss Wall's uh, concerns with a uh, number of tours a day and what they're anticipated. Like, do you have an 18 passenger van that, so that it's going to be limited to that number of people. So if you'd go up to the, or one of the microphones, hit the button, make it green, and then tell me all the stuff you can tell me. And, and actually, uh, Mr. Price, and I'm going to ask you not to <laughs> invite people up. <laughs> I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I want to remind you a little bit of that. Yeah. And I do believe there is information in our packet that speaks to uh, what they're, or I certainly found it somewhere last night that uh, talks to how many people they anticipate, how many tours a day, et cetera. So um, we can double check that, but go ahead. You bet. Um, Madam Chair, other members of the Lands Committee, thank you for letting me speak. My name is Reuben Willis. I'm one of four owners of iRide Alaska. Uh, our DBAs are Segway Alaska and eBikes Alaska. Uh, we don't rent bikes. Um, rather, we do tours where guests are guided and 
we present and let them enjoy the beauty that we have to offer here in Juneau. Um, they're relatively small groups. Our vans are 15 passenger, but we plan on only 10 people. That's the number of bikes that we have. Uh, uh, there could be a circumstance where a family, a larger family maybe is gonna participate. We could go to 12, but there's not an anticipation of going larger than that. Uh, the tours are planned to be run three times a day, one earlier in the morning, one in the midday and one later in the afternoon, um, thereby minimizing uh, our presence. Number one, number two, uh, we think this could be a win-win for both us because of the limited number of activities that are available for our guests that come. Also the opportunity to present the beauty that we have to offer. In addition, uh, through sales tax that's generated, the city will benefit as well as lands whatever fee structure is established would allow needed dollars that they have to manage that property that they have very little dollars to manage. And uh, we see that as a, a positive thing for everybody. All right, thank you, Mr. Willis, yeah. right? Ruben. Ruben, sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Willis. So, yeah, I appreciate that, Mr. Willis. Um, Ms. Wall, you have a question? Did you? Uh, thank you for being here. Um, can you talk about just because the rainforest trail permit is so is kind of you know easy for me to get my head wrapped around what what kind of um, traffic are you permitted currently to do there and you know how how often how many people typically are e bike using e bikes on on that trail? Well, the e bike is new to us this year. Um, we saw a need and a complementing uh, tour that we could offer. Uh, there are rentals, but there's no e-bike tours currently being offered in Judo. And so um, as far as the Rainforest Trail goes, uh, the permit with the city there, we pay a $3 a head fee tax or user fee per participant, uh, generating again revenue for maintaining the trail and keeping it up. Uh, originally that trail was made specifically so as not to conflict with locals using other trails and giving a commercial use specific. I am not aware of a limit, but it, uh, the tours that we operate there are the same. Um, we may add another one this year, um, depending on the time and the, uh, of the cruise ships that are coming in. Uh, yeah. And then additionally, besides the rainforest, we have an agreement with the city um, and operate on the um, cross country ski trail up at Eagle Crest. Um, another just amazing, beautiful place to share with people with uh, a similar fee structure and similar participants. Uh, we've been in operation for, oh, and thank you. The rainforest trail itself is not ridden on. Uh, there are there's no riding on the trail itself, but to the trail head. Um, so no, we're not going to be riding down the trail on a on an e bike or um, or on a Segway either. It's limited to the trail head. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Uh, Mr. Bryson, you had a follow up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what is your anticipated retail price of this uh, tour? Sure. Um, at this point, we have priced it at one forty nine ninety five. And the three dollar. Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Follow up. Go ahead. The the three dollar fee. That's in addition to sales tax, and that's just the fee structure. Yeah, it comes out of that. Okay. Um, the sales tax is actually on top of that fee structure, but the um, three dollar a head tax or user fee is more appropriate, is taken out of uh, the net. Um, let me restate that. It's taken out of the amount that we earn. It's not added to. Thank you, Mr. Willis. I'm not seeing any other, uh, not quite yet, Mr. Bryson. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Myrtle, you have a question. 
I do. Thank you, Ms. Chair. So quick question. Are you catering the e-bike tours to people with mobility issues or older people, or is it just to the general public? It's in general public. Um, we have, in fact, our screening criteria specifically um, questions regarding mobility and the ability to bike for 10 miles at a, at a time and without back, knee, back, you know, arm, shoulder, other issues. But the e-bike does allow an interesting option for someone who may not quite be as physically um, fit um, or perhaps to equalize the riding experience so people can stay together the assistance, and it's not a throttle, it is pedal assist, uh, allows for the electric part of the motor to assist those who need a little more um, assist. But those that want the exercise, they can reduce the power setting. Uh, and these are maxed at 22 miles an hour. I think it's a class two, if I'm remembering class correctly. It's not the 40 mile an hour throttle and spin your tire kind of great. Experience. Great. Thank you, Mr. Willis. I'm not seeing any other questions from the uh, assembly members. Mr. Myrtle, I see you have another question. I just want to be cognizant of time. Like I said, we just want to get the questions at this point to see if we support moving it to the assembly. And it's great having more detail. I'm going to jump in with a question because we do have to get through our other action item. And I wanna leave time to talk about housing. Um, Mr. Blydorn, uh, this question is for you. I just wanted to ask um, one benefit of this would be the uh, financial resources to manage land, which you know in the memo is you don't have a lot right now. Do you have off the top of your head what the annual cost for that road is? Or our maintenance of uh, culverts, question. et cetera. And so we've been lucky the last few years because we've collaborated with Eagle Crest who needed some timber from out there. So they did a really expensive, large culvert clean out for us that would have cost uh, more than $10,000 to do. And then regular maintenance of the of the parking lot. We've had, like I said, we've had some volunteers out there doing things. And so it's hard to get a rough number, but I'd say anywhere from ten to to $20,000 a year. Okay. I guess. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Lots of trees the last few years with all the wind storms and lots of gravel and rocks moving down the mountainsides. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Mr. Myrtle, I will jump back to you and if you could just keep it short. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And it's more just a comment, I think, leading up on Mr. Blighthorn's perhaps prompting. Um, Parks and Rec does have a commercial use permit. Um, one of the big challenges, and I don't think it's been resolved, is e-bikes. Currently, they're considered a motorized mode of transportation. So they are currently not allowed on trails, and we, whether it's been dealt with recently, um, there was a permit application for e-bikes on the CAX Trail or the Brotherhood Bridge Trail, and it was denied because it's considered motorized transportation. The Park Service, the Forest Service, everybody is trying to figure out where this gray mode of transportation fits. So I think I just want to offer a little bit of caution before we jump into this with both feet into the pool here that it may have repercussions beyond just this one proposal before us. Um, I think perhaps as a test, because it's not a road and it's not a trail, maybe this is an opportunity to test the waters, but maybe we want to add a sunset to it as well so we can do a checks and balance to make sure it's being successful. And then just to answer Ms. Wall's uh, inquiry, Generally, the nice thing about a commercial use permit is they do have limitations to capacities, visitors, when. So there are those rules and expectations set up that try to preserve the user experience for all on that trail. So hopefully we can do something similar with this. So I just want to provide a little bit of Parks and Rec insight. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mardo. That's very helpful and kind of coloring this discussion. So I appreciate that. Do we have a motion or do we have uh, outstanding questions? Uh, Ms. Well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm gonna move that um, 
the Lands Housing and Economic Development Committee forward this to the full assembly. And if I could speak to my motion, please, you'll you'll notice that I did not include with a motion of support. Um, I personally am not ready to to do that, but I don't want to kill this. That's I'm just one member of of nine, and so um, by sending it to the full assembly, um, we can have that conversation still, and and I can ask some further questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wall. Mr. Blydorn, does that meet your need to keep the process moving forward, or do you need a motion of support in order to begin negotiations? Um, that motion will suffice. Thank you. Okay, great. Any objections? Okay, thank you, Ms. Wall. And thank you, Mr. Willis, for answering all our questions and for your interest. <coughs> So that brings us to agenda topic, Juno Affordable Housing uh, Fund Loan Agreements. I can't read. Uh, and I believe we have Mr. Chambor coming up to talk about that. Is that correct? That's correct, Madam Chair. He'll be right here. Great. All right. So we have a uh, memo for Mr. Chambor in our packet on page 15. And this is another request for action to forward to the full assembly. So Mr. Chambor, take it away. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the memo asks for a, a motion of support to uh, bring an ordinance with final contract terms for the rooftop properties alone uh, to the next assembly meeting. Uh, so that will be available for the assembly. The reason, uh, if you recall, round two of the affordable housing fund rooftop properties was awarded a $1.2 million loan. Uh, in the program guidelines for the Juno Affordable Housing Fund, uh, terms for the loan are uh, noted as 0% loans. Uh, in code, uh, it has a floating rate, which would put the current floating rate up at 4.3%. Uh, according to the finance director, that has risen significantly since the summer. And so this ordinance is needed in order to provide the terms promised in the Affordable Housing Fund. Uh, and those uh, ordinance with the contract details will be available for the assembly on the 27th. Thank you, Mr. Chambor. Questions on the memo or floating rate or anything? Not seeing any, uh, do I have a motion? Mr. Bryson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move uh, that Lands Housing and Economic Development move a motion to support for a non-code ordinance with a loan agreement terms for rooftop properties to be forwarded to the assembly and ask for unanimous consent. Seeing no objections, that's all moved. Thank you. Okay, so is that all of our action items? I believe it is. So we have our beautiful square of tables uh, for a little bit more of an informal uh, conversation about housing and getting caught up by staff. So grab your microphones and bring them down to the table, please. I'm I was yeah, no, I, 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 okay i'll put my mic back on so we're back on the record 
So the next topics we're going to talk to about are the notes from the assembly retreat and a housing progress tracker that staff has created for us. And I think the idea and being around the table as I talked with Mr. Manager, and I think we want to continue the good conversations we are having uh, at the retreat about housing and try to really figure out how we keep this ball moving forward. And part of that is figuring out because we have a lot of ideas, what we should be focusing on with staff's input and have those conversations. And um, we also have in our packet, we have notes from Ms. Wall. Ms. Wall, thank you so much for leading that piece uh, of the retreat and for your continued efforts in that. So who shall I turn to to get us started? Madam Chair, can I just mention that we have Carol Treem is going to join us as a panelist as well. Uh, Perfect. Member Treem. And then also note that uh, the supplemental information on page 27 of your packet is for this uh, item number for the assembly notes. That was the addition of the um, updated notes from Ms. Wall. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Blydorn. And I'm sorry that I got you the wrong notes on that. I believe also um, we heard from Ms. Hale. So if she is on the line. She can't join us today, sorry. Oh, okay, that's fine. Okay, perfect. Well, if we have anyone else, I heard from several assembly members. So. If if anyone is on the line, feel free to bring them all over as panelists, and that way it'll be easier to see them. Mr. Myrtle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, just a quick clarification. Obviously, for the liaisons, we weren't part of the work session or the, the assembly get-together, um, and we are liaisons. So what is our role in this process? And, yep, I've in the eight years, nine years, I've never been to a work session with this group, so I just want to understand our roles and expectations for the liaisons. That is a great question because you may be saying, how does that go inside? Well, we haven't had a lot of work sessions within a committee. So in the, at least in the four years I've been here. So um, I think for our planning commission liaison, that might be more of a direct link than docks and harbors or parks. Probably not a lot, but it's good for you to be listening and you know, should anything arise, but I'm not expecting a lot. Happy to have you here. So Mr. Manager, you wanna take it away? Sure, and I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about the theory behind this meeting. Um, in the formal setting, we can get geared up for memos and presentations and a deliberative cadence. And really what we wanted to do was get everything on the table, have an informal discussion about, okay, if we pursue this, these are the kinds of things uh, that are problems, showstoppers, blocks, time critical, whatever, just so that everybody kind of understood, um, you know, the pros and cons of, of them all, because they're, they're all great ideas, and they're all hard and easy in different ways. And so if we can, if we can uh, kind of get back to what we were thinking at the retreat, um, there was, there was some motivation to pick a few big things and do them rather than try to do everything at once. Thank you for that, Mr. Manager. So I'm looking at our housing folks and uh, and CDD folks and Mr. Sure. Dombor, you want to get us started? Yeah. So uh, yes, I'll do the, the the grounding for the document and and the rest of the discussion. So uh, uh, big picture, uh, I'd like to summarize the housing action plan in three bullet points, so you don't have to read it, uh, and to make everybody kind of remember why this sort of a table and all these initiatives are being taken. One, uh, Juno has a fragile economy and inconsistent uh, housing development over time has facilitated to housing need across the board. Uh, land use, uh, land is scarce uh, and the way land has been used uh, in the past has not been in inefficient. So any sort of uh, residential creation moving forward is gonna have to be economical and, and very efficient. We have to uh, safeguard uh, the land that is available to build on. And then the third piece is CBJ as an organization uh, needs to utilize all of its tools uh, in order to get through those initial two barriers. Uh, and so those are, uh, you know, cash through grants and loans, tax abatement, uh, uh, and then use of its land uh, for disposals and public private partnerships, uh, as well as um, uh, how it regulates uh, 
through the land use code. Uh, and so the good thing about uh, those are your major tools. Uh, and the good thing about this tracker that you have in front of me is those first three sections are right there aligned uh, with your goals that came out of the, of the retreat with the main tools that you have at your disposal. Uh, so those categories are where, where you'll probably do the majority of your work. Uh, and as far as the tracker, it was created out of the CBJ Housing Assembly Goals, uh, um, uh, Assembly Member Walls uh, Summary, leftover items from the Housing Action Plan, and a couple of things the staff added, uh, primarily around short-term rentals, because although not extensively talked about at the retreat, uh, it's going to be coming back to the Finance Committee here shortly uh, uh, with some ideas that we'll have to address. So that's the general idea. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how you're going to want to review these, but that was the general uh, idea from putting this together. Um, it will be able to be a public document for the committee to work off of. It will be posted with our, our other housing action plan reports so the public can follow along. Um, and we can make changes and additions as, as we move things forward. Great. So with that, that kind of gives us a grounding for what we have. We've all, I'm sure, looked at the tracker. Then, um, Mr. Manager, unless you have a different uh, approach for how you want to get going on this. And I see you look like you have an idea. Or no, you don't. Oh, you're just listening. Okay. Well, no, I think that's good. I think that's good. I, I have had the advantage or I've had uh, at least a, a, a miniature chance in preparing for this meeting to look at this tracker, uh, albeit very briefly, with Mr. Chambor and Mr. Myers. Sorry, I always think of your first name and not your last name. Um, and uh, ask questions. So I guess I'll start by saying, Assembly members, questions, comments on the tracker, on the organization, or what you see as missing, or whether this is the right way to be tracking things. Ms. Wall. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just, I, um, I think this is great and um, appreciate the list and the ability to track things. And I assume kind of our goal is deleting a lot of these like as as priorities is that am I did I read the room right <laughs> on that one and I, I'll just speak for my own note the notes that I put forward were like everything everyone talked about with an idea that there was no way we were going to be able to do all those things and but the assembly had to start with kind of our brainstorm which is totally fine but do we see this list getting smaller, I guess, is my question. Mr. Jambar. Sure. So through the chair, I think it's it's a couple of things. Um, one, it's just to show the work that's being done, right? So obviously the assembly, manager's office, planning commission, there's a lot of people with housing uh, on their mind. It's just a clear way to show what has been done uh, because actually the assembly, especially in the last three years, deserves a lot of credit for putting a lot of their tools into place. Uh, you have public-private partnerships. Uh, you're providing lands through subdivisions. Uh, you're you're got the housing fund up and running for two years in a row now, fully funded. Uh, so you're doing a lot of great work and need to take credit for that. I think moving forward, um, it gets difficult. It's more and more difficult <laughs> to do uh, impactful uh, items. And so this is a way to help you figure out what you can do, what's most impactful, and help prioritize for staff where you want us to go so that we can be as effective as possible. Uh, Ms. Cole, <laughs> all first name, no last name. <laughs> Takes me a minute to think of the last name. No, thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting the Planning Commission to, to kind of comment and be a part of this because I think, you know, as I think I'm on about my second and a half year on the Planning Commission. And, you know, I think there's, there has been a lot of work done and there's been some confusion about where to put efforts, right? So we get the most direct um, instruction from the assembly through our kind of joint meetings. And, and sometimes those yield clear steps and sometimes they yield more like do good things, you know, or something that's, that's vaguer and, um, 
<laughs> and, and and less ac actionable to put on a, on a piece of paper and so just from you know i want to kind of like say play the new card just for a minute just from that from the new card perspective um priorities that are that are clearly set at a particular time each year that we can work through and then report back on would be I think step number number one because your tools include um, title 49 and so you kind of have to work through us to get to title, four, <laughs> title 49 just it's a, it's the only way it, it, it can happen and we're trying to work through title 49 um, things come up for us at the planning commission and we see a legislative fix that needs to happen and then we get something from the assembly that might need to happen and there's no discussion on kind of like or there is there are many discussions on what get, comes first right so i think partly just really clearing up the process of what you would like to see from title 49 um, and the schedule on which you would like to see it would be a beautiful place to start Thank you for that, Ms. Cole. Ms. Bryson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cole. I appreciate you doing good things. Um, I like the schedule idea. Um, my question was, how do we, let's take the one that I like that just caught my eye, the uh, incentivizing tiny homes or additional uh, manufactured home uh, neighborhoods or one, one story, smaller homes. It seems like that is a pretty low hanging fruit we could with maybe would have to go through title nine 49 maybe it was something that the assembly could say we want to permit this type of housing how would say c10 how would we get that scheduled what's the best way to get the things that we well like if i consider it low-hanging fruit or another member of this committee sees that as an easier achievable goal how do we get that scheduled and start to get that into the hopper of, I know that we can't incent do this thing next month, but could we have incentives for tiny homes and those regulations done in a three month time period so that in this summer season, that's something that could happen. How do these individual tasks, how can we get it scheduled and how can we start like I, I want to get a, the first three things going by the end of this meeting. How do we do that? Thank you, Mr. Chambar. Sure, through the chair. So um, I'm glad uh, both Mandy and Wade brought up goal C uh, because if you look at that section, and we can go through each section to kind of explain how each each are lined up. But this section in particular is kind of lined up uh, as they are prioritized and queued up. Uh, for the planning commission at this point. Uh, so if you see C1, uh, Title 49 uh, is scheduled already for a Title 49 committee meeting uh, to be addressed. Uh, Streams Ordinance and Wetland Review Board is, is queued up for the planning commission on the 28th. Hazard mapping is coming and accessory apartments. Uh, and then on another list is, is uh, the discussion about short-term rentals, which also may have a, a pressing uh, piece. And so if you take those uh, in, 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 uh, in order and of priority and, and what's coming forward, you know, getting through the process uh, may be a year's work. Uh, so that might be the priority uh, schedule for, for the year, unless uh, you tell us otherwise to bump up and say, this is the more impactful priority. Thanks, Mr. Chambor and Mr. Bryson. I know you have a follow up, but um, uh, Mr. Manager is dying to say something too. Yeah, I don't want to be your uh, uh, the, be the dampen your enthusiasm guy. Um, <laughs> Do it, but I have to, <laughs> right? So, like, like the idea of a schedule, it's just not going to happen, right? So, what happens with the department is we tell the department focus on permitting, right? And we can't be like focus on permitting today and then you know do what we think is low hanging fruit tomorrow and then oh wait, wait wait you're behind on permitting we can't do that to them there there really isn't any low hanging fruit and with title 49 what seems like an easy and a good idea those are the title 49 committee and maybe the planning commission sees some big flaws or maybe the law department sees some like errors you know issues or maybe somebody in the public pops up and says did you think about this so we with title 49 we we just have to be patient with our process there are a lot of people involved and uh 
it's just never fast. Thanks, Mr. Yeah. Manager, but not thanks. Uh, Mr. Bryson, I want to give so you that follow up. That so. is a perfect segue into my next question. Which one of these items can we use our magic wand on and skip the process <laughs> of beating it down through the ringer and, you know, putting it through every scrutiny? Would you categorize, and maybe this is for Mr. Chambor, but Mr. Manager probably might have a better idea. Um, goal C uh, in 49, do you see all of these as having a necessity and the benefit of going through that one-year process or the in, any of these that have either like 10C, what would prevent the assembly from saying, I would like to have an ordinance that allowed uh, incentives for tiny homes and uh, senior one-story homes? Um, and then we just said, okay, instead of putting it through the ringer, we're just going to activate this so that now it's part of uh, zoning. And the assembly just sticks a rule in there that now developers can access that size of project for the land that they have. Or am I being too enthusiastic, as Mr. Manager put it? <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Chambor. Sure. Uh, so through the chair. Uh, so I think uh, just a little bit more background on what's ahead. So streams ordinance uh, has been you know, desired by the development community for a long time. So getting that out is, is a priority. Um, accessory apartments seems to have a lot of big impact uh, if that one can get through. So those are two big uh, uh, pieces, hopefully done within the next six months. Uh, so that's, that's fantastic. Uh, in terms of that uh, idea in, in particular, um, I think that would just be allocating some staff time to figure out, you know, what exactly is this? Is it a land use code incentive or is it a, a financial incentive uh, that perhaps does not have to go through uh, a rigorous uh, land use code process, but is instead more of a, uh, a grant and loan or just another program added to, you know, you know goal A? Uh, so I, we don't know exactly what that idea is, but we could add some staff time. Uh, if there is a, a an assembly person who wants to champion that idea. I'm going to break from, you know, going last because I think the whole point is to break from uh, all the decorum a little bit is why we're down here. So I'm going to follow up on uh, Mr. Bryson's because I think that actually is a really good question, because if you compare that, I'm sure Ms. Cole has thoughts when she hears about like, so how do we just skip the planning commission? Uh, which is essentially what we're saying. And uh, and I, I think it's important to know, I think uh, with our damp blanket, our realism blanket, I should say, not our damp blanket, Mr. Manager saying, be realistic, it's not going to be fast. Then you have a bunch of assembly members who are saying, I don't care. I want off this blanket. I want it to be faster. Like, how can I cut corners? Uh, so I do think it's a worthy question because this tying that question if you go back and you look at the raw notes or the the less synthesized notes that miss wall did you'll see comments that were made at the retreat because not everybody was there that staff who were staffing the different stations said what you're describing is like eliminating the planning commission some of your guys ideas like here i've got an idea like we just make a law and then we implement it and we don't send them these sorts of things. Or maybe we only let them do with this, or maybe we hire someone and they don't deal with any of those things. These are all ideas that are being floated around. So maybe I'm trying to think, you know, how that fits into the discussion, because I think I'm very excited about housing. Uh, I think C is like a, you know, that's a really big one. And when I, was preparing for this meeting, I said, and Mr. John Bohr provided a little bit more feedback, like for instance, the streams ordinance, why that makes sense, why that's a good idea, the development needs it, they're almost done, their satisfaction and getting that off their list, that's a good idea. But when I look at these, you know, when I look at it, top five is basically going to be our year when you look at the speed of government and how things get scheduled and people get sick and sometimes there's not quorum. Um, 
So I think we maybe need then as an assembly to be really thoughtful either about our top five and or make what are potentially bad choices or consider like, do we want to make bad choices if a bad choice would be like cutting our process or changing our process? And maybe that's not a bad choice, but I think it's worth thinking, do we want to come up with something crazy? And that's probably for the manager to say, don't do that. Or, you know, that's why we want staff feedback. So say that. <laughs> like anything started, finish, right? So for those things that have like 25% or 50%, let's finish those right? That's like number one. And then below that line, all those things that have 0%, rejigger those to your heart's content. Um, but, and when we pick those things early on, try to come up with uh, a defined scope and avoid scope creep. So one of the problems we have with Title 49 is you start to work on one section of the code. It seems like a good idea to fix other things associated with it. And uh, it can mushroom on you pretty hard, pretty fast. Yes, thank you. That's super helpful. Uh, Ms. Cole, you should get in here. Just briefly. Um, I think Mr. Chambor actually gave you um, a, an alternative to um, the assembly directly uh, reworking the land use code. If you want something, put the money behind it and incentivize it as a grant or, or loan program, kind of like we did with accessory apartments or the mobile home projects. Um, because those things, they can have unintended consequences, and we've seen unintended consequences from some of those, but at least those are within scope and shape that we can address quickly when there are those consequences, whereas the land co use code, um, it the unintended consequences within changing that can often mean uh, heartbreak for this entire community and financial disaster and, and lots of legal um, challenges and appeals, which is one of the reasons why um, we are so careful when changing and proposing changes to the land use code because we've been burned, right? Like that's, I mean, that's really the reason why it moves so slowly. Um, the other reason, and I'm sure Mr. Chamber would be able to tell you, is like the planning commission, the committee of Title 49 and the planning commission is just like a few people, right? And, and staff time is necessary because while we're good intentioned people who have a certain level of expertise, we don't have the same expertise that Mr. Chamber and Mr. Myers. Did. And so like, ultimately we can move at the speed of good hearted <laughs> volunteers and staff. Um, and I, I'll say it one last time because I got schooled on it last time, which was the comp, without a comp plan update, um, staff feels really hamstrung in terms of of moving new land use ideas forward. So, you know, that's where. That's incredibly helpful, um, Ms. Cole. Mr. Bidorn, and then we'll jump into you. Um, I was just stating that Carol Treem, Assemblymember Treem has her hand raised. Oh, great. And she's been moved over. Yeah, she's moved I'm over. There. She just has her hand Okay, raised. great. Ms. Treem, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think I just wanted to chime in and maybe join the the damp blanket club. Is that what are you saying? It was damp. Um, <laughs> it's not. It's not just the process. I think that we have to uh, think about. You know, we could we could eliminate the planning commission or something, and sure, that would eliminate steps in the process. But I think we have to think really hard about staff time because we can say tomorrow we want an ordinance to do whatever, but somebody has to actually write that ordinance. And that means they're not gonna do the other thing that we've told them that we want them to do. So I just wanted to bring that up in this conversation. Thank you, Ms. Dream. That is super helpful and super relevant to all of this. I do wanna acknowledge the planning, uh, stepping outside the planning commission, the, what we've put on CDD, when you really look at the staffing of CDD, which says nothing about turnover and vacancies, but just the general staffing, uh, recently re-looked at that and had a conversation with the director, is quite small for um, what we want them to do. We want them to operate at the level of a much larger department, and they're not. So 
I guess that's good for us to keep in our heads while we're talking about C. Uh, Mr. Bryson. Oh, and I'm sorry. Then we'll get back to you. Good. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, so just a couple of quick observations. Has anyone gone through and looked at your priorities and passed the red face test? Does it meet the intent of Title 49? Does it meet the intent of the comp plan? Does it fit in with the land use mapping? And if it does, those to me seem like the ones you can check off pretty quickly. I'm not a big fan of bypassing a public process, but I think that if you go through and validate them and do that analysis, you may be able to say we can check these off without getting too crazy. But following up with what Ms. Cole said is all this housing discussion I've heard on this committee over the last seven, eight years is relatively new. And the comp plan was last done in 2013. So the comp plan doesn't support all these great ideas that you've come up with. So you need that process, like Ms. Cole said, I hate to say it, you didn't fund it four years ago when it was up for um, getting done. Um, I believe that's correct, but I don't... Don't look at you, Mr. Watt. Um, <laughs> you know, I for, it's almost like I forgot what was going on in the world <laughs> when that was an yeah. idea. It's almost yeah. like we didn't have a public health crisis going on yeah. that was worldwide. The budget, and we deleted it. We, <laughs> like everything is crashing, and we stopped. And yes. We yeah. Should have spent COVID doing the comp plan. Exactly. <laughs> plan is the perfect time to do it. Yes. Hindsight is extremely <laughs> 2020, is all I want to say about all our things that we deleted from the budget. And and I'm not looking to go back and create a huge public process, but you do need to get the comp plan rolling again, because that feeds into Title 49, feeds into your land use mapping, and it's going to give you the tools to get things done quickly. So I'm just throwing that out. I'm with Ms. Cole totally, is you've got to get the comp plan rolling again, because that really is the vehicle that allows you to get all these things and tick these boxes, because you've got so many great ideas but they're just not validated in any of your previous planning documents. But again, maybe there are some that pass the red face test because comp plans are a little loose. Title 49, definitely tighter. But you know, are there a couple of things that passes the red face test and you say, we can do this, this, and this, let's get them done. So that's just an observation. So noted, thank you for that. Mr. Bryson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I didn't wanna imply that I was just like, hey, let's get rid of planning commission. We'll just uh, have assembly authorize all of these. Um, <laughs> however, I, what my, go we'll save all kinds of staff time. Um, uh, allow me to go down this train of thought here though, where every time the assembly has like a thought or an action they want developed, that staff time, which is essentially money. I was hoping that there might be ways that we can help facilitate achieving these goals. So if the assembly could implement or, and I don't even know like what a good example would be, but I was hoping that we could use the authority of the assembly to maybe fast track some of the changes that you guys want. Like you were talking about stream ordinances, those have been in discussions for how many years? How could the assembly help finalize the stream setback ordinances for androgynous water bodies? What work could the assembly do that could help facilitate that, right? Piece of cake is easy stuff. We do next weekend. Um, the other, the only other point that I want to make to this is that while these are all of the actions that we have here, um, I've always strongly felt that some level of programming to help prep citizens to becoming homeowners is as important to creating housing in Juneau. Um, I just saw the first picture or the first flyer for a first time home buyer program. Um, I think it was at First Bank that a lady's teaching one class one night on how to prepare people, how to get into the first homes. We have an entire generation of people that just don't have a lot of experience knowing how to navigate your first home purchase. And if we don't look at the problem from this, the citizen's perspective, we can do all this great work here, but if we're not developing the next round of home buyers, we're kind of shorting ourselves. So those are the two things. How can the assembly help move this process along for the groups that are trying to move things through the process 
and what can we do to help citizens become more capable homeowners, which would help them either upgrade their home, go from a trailer to a condo or a condo to a single family or maybe a single family to the duplex or, you, you know, what? Uh, those, that's how we move everybody forward and keep those single family homes open and uh, more available, which will keep the price down. So uh, I think those are two things that I think would help this whole process. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that thought. Other thoughts on, it seems like we've been talking a lot about C, which is good. Other thoughts from staff, or it was a fine place to start on C or other thoughts from assembly members on section C of our tracker. So just um, following up on the comp plan conversation, just an update for the committee. Um, uh, we are putting out the senior planner position for the third time. Uh, so as we got funding, uh, we're low on staff and we're still trying to wrap up downtown blueprint and downtown Douglas plans. So uh, amongst, uh, you know, uh, two and a half staff. So uh, pretty heavy lift trying to, you know, finish what we've uh, started and then uh, hopefully hire and get some some new blood in to help with a, a, a future comp plan initiative. Thank you for that, Mr. Chambor. Other thought, Ms. Call. Thank you. And I, I would just imagine that it, it might be helpful to the assembly to think of um, kind of two tracks of, of problem solving. There's changing the land use code, which is like a, a slower process. I think we've been clear about that with long-term impacts. There are tools at your disposal for short-term impacts. And so partly, you know, it, it may really behoove this committee to, to think about, you know, are we looking to get 400 more units in two years? That's a short term in housing term, in housing <laughs> speak, that's a short term goal. Uh, and, and that's, you know, something that's probably going to be, regardless of the land use code, it, you're going to have to put money behind it, right? Money is going to make people figure out this land use code and build some units for you. And so, you know, kind of um, imagining that there are two tracks of, there's the there's the comp plan growth, what we want Juno to look like has to be slow and deliberate, must be slow and deliberate because it it's forever, right? Or for the foreseeable future. And then there are shorter term goals um, to respond to a crisis. And, and those you you also can act on and that doesn't take a Title 49 committee and a year worth of streams, like discussion. Thanks for that. Ms. Cole, uh, Mr. Chamber. So let, let's piggyback off of uh, that commentary and go into goal A. Perfect. Uh, because that is really where housing fund, tax abatement, and other incentives lie. Uh, and so um, if you look at A1 through A5, those are all details uh, surrounding the affordable housing fund. So, you know, congratulations to this assembly. Uh, the framework for an affordable housing fund has been in place since 2010. Uh, it has now had two successive years of competition, and you've put out more dollars into housing projects uh, than has been done uh, in a two-year time period uh, ever since. So kudos to you. Um, the goal for um, uh, the assembly moving forward in terms of the housing fund is to structure it so that it continues. Uh, we have tons of, of housing needs studies, tons of examples of a, an affordable housing fund in 1991 uh, that had almost the exact framework that we have today, uh, but the problem was it wasn't consistently run. Uh, so the goal, I think, for this assembly is to make sure that that program moves forward. So uh, things, uh, you will be getting a report uh, at, at a future lands committee about the housing fund that includes the budget, project updates, uh, some suggested changes to the guidelines for next year, uh, specifically listed a couple that we've learned because we've just are in the final stages of uh, putting in contracts for our first pre-development loan and uh, construction loan through the process. So we've learned some things that we want to add to the guidelines to bring forward to you. Um, and then the big thing for you is, you know, how to um, allocate funding for the next round in your budget process. Uh, so you'll get that report um, uh, shortly. 
Um, the other piece is the other programs uh, that you have in place, the accessory apartment grant program and the mobile home down payment assistance. Again, we'll like to bring a report uh, with some suggested uh, amendments to those two programs as well. Um, specifically the accessory apartment grant because it's been five years since the last time it was issued. So it expires at the end of June. Um, and then as we've reported to the assembly the past couple of years, uh, you know, time has changed and some priorities about the program uh, and economics have changed it. So perhaps uh, there may be some tweaking about the level of grant uh, required um, in, 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 re in, re in return for some affordability and not using a short-term rental, which has been a desire too. So uh, that will come forward for some decisions. Um, and then the mobile home loan program too, as uh, single family homes and everything else has risen in price. So have manufactured homes. So we've talked with True North Federal Credit Union uh, partners who said uh, the $10,000 uh, loan isn't going as far as it used to. Uh, so perhaps allowing uh, a, a greater level of funding for that uh, for you to decide as well. So those are the current programs. Tax abatement, again, you know, that was a tool that only came to the assembly uh, four years ago and you've almost maxed it out. Uh, you've based it for accessory apartments, uh, downtown housing, and now multifamily over four if they meet certain criteria. So uh, at CDD, we promote those programs uh, intensely. So uh, it'll take a little bit of time for a development community to start utilizing them. So, so kudos there. Um, one program that has been bandied around for a long time in various committees is a downtown rehabilitation loan program to kind of cover like sprinkler systems and health and safety costs. That's still in kind of in a conceptual stage. Uh, but if you want to do more for downtown, um, you, uh, advise staff to put those terms together and, and, and provide funding for that. Great. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chambor. I have a question for Ms. Stream and I have a question for Mr. Bryson. Go ahead, Thank, you, Madam, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, question on the affordable housing fund. We've taken action to put a bunch of money in it recently, and um, we haven't been appropriating the whole thing, which is good. We shouldn't, but I think there's um, appetite to appropriate more than we have been. I can't remember the process, I guess, is the in the budget process is the what's going to be presented to us probably just the same amount as the last year and then we have to decide or is that totally up to the assembly during that budget process i could mr manager refresh my memory it's up to the assembly in the budget process yeah. okay. okay is there is there an amount that we're starting with or are we like starting from okay anyway sorry i'm trying yeah, to sure. remember Sure. Uh, yes, uh, through the chair, um, uh, the housing fund has, I, I, last year you put $5 million into the fund, uh, and there's also going to be initial sales tax. Uh, so our department needs to work with finance to provide you with that budget at the okay. next meeting uh, awesome. to show exactly what is in the overall corpus of the fund. Um, and then if you recall, each budget season around it around this time you start you making a decision to how much of that big corpus do you want to go out into a competitive rent the first year was 650,000 this year was 2 million um and that seems to be a good targeted range uh for projects anything more i think you'll probably be running up against capacity issues on the development side uh but that that could potentially be a target for you guys to consider Perfect. Thank you. I I did not recall, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So hard hard to hold on to these things, uh, Mr. Bryson. You had a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, downtown rehabilitation loan program. Uh, oh, you mentioned sprinklers, but there are several apartments downtown that are either in. Uh, what are they called? Or, uh, you can't live in them, or uh, inhospitable. No. Not up um, the code. Current? Not up to code. Uh, I'm thinking of the gross Alaska apartments that are vacant. There's a handful of other buildings that have uh, under code uh, apartments that are not being utilized. How well does this uh, A10 downtown rehabilitation loan fit the needs of redeveloping some of the downtown housing, which is the area that we need the most housing in? How does all that fit together, please? Mr. Manager. So one of the things that I often say is we are not a bank um, when ideas come up, but we are becoming a bank. 
uh, we have the um, <laughs> gas no lodges loan, the rooftop uh, development loan, and they've been a lot harder than you would imagine because we're we're loaning money uh, to projects that banks wouldn't loan under these terms, right? Is how to do those loans in a way that aren't too risky and are collateralized that works with the funding stream. So we're getting we're getting better at it, and it's been it's been really painful. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Brown's not here anymore, but it's Chan, Mr. Chambor and version Mr. twenty seven. Yeah, yeah, it's super super painful. So we're getting better at it. So that's I, and all I'll say is that on the loan program for. Uh, downtown rehabilitation or A13 loan program for roads. They're, they're both great ideas. Um, and where we lack expertise is understanding how a city loan can fit in private capital, private lending, and not, not mess that up. And we need, um, we're getting better at it, but we need like the developers and the banks to engage on those uh, in order for us to be productive. So that's, those are my comments. That's helpful. Mr. Chambor, did you want to add? Sure, yes. And uh, through the chair, we have a couple of guidelines of programs elsewhere. Uh, and the way it works is it's basically a list of eligible activities similar to the housing fund, uh, but more on health and safety and remediation. Uh, and so like if you have to fix your problem for asbestos or, or when, like I say, sprinklers or fire safety things, it would cover those types of costs, which you know, we've been told many times that is a deterrent for even thinking about developing units uh, because uh, that initial cost to remedy something that's an older problem is seems as a big barrier. So putting it out there could be helpful. Thanks, Mr. Chambor, as well. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry if I miss this, but my question is about A5, which is identifying a dedicated revenue source for the housing fund. Um, you know, I, I'm appreciative that this assembly and the last two assemblies have put some big chunks of funding in there, but, you know, I want to create systems that last beyond the, beyond us. <laughs> and so, um, you know, my, you know, and that stability helps everybody. Um, do my question is like, do people, do we have ideas? Like, do, are there proposals for what that would look, it's pretty it's high on the list kind of at the moment. You, you don't have to answer what those ideas are, but like, are we in a place that we could have that discussion at some point? Um, so when Mr. Rogers during the budget process asks you on the decision list or the pending list, is this a one-time decision or an ongoing decision, right? That's a, that's where you want to be. So all of our housing fund funding decisions have been one-time or short duration. So we move money from fund balance one time. We put it on the temporary sales tax. It's five years, but it's one time. And if you want to make it permanent, um, my recommendation would be to embed it in the operating budget of the, I imagine the community development department. And you're just going to be like, when you submit your budget every year, you're going to submit this number and escalate it for inflation or something. And then it's, it's part of the budget process. I think that's where you want to be. Super helpful. Thank you for that, Mr. Manager. I'm going to jump in with a couple of questions. Um, more comments? Yes, Mr. Myrtle. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Myrtle. But also to say real quickly, uh, I work with a lot of other communities. Oh, my God. I deal with a lot of other communities that are dealing with housing issues, and everyone keeps looking to Juno saying, you guys are doing the most out of any community in Alaska. So, mm -hmm. no, I think hats off to you guys. Um, you know, as I do planning in other communities, they're always saying, what are they doing? What's Juno doing? What's Juno doing? So, you know, I think you guys do deserve a pat on your back, both having a housing czar and from the actions of the assembly. Thank you, everybody. Thank Enjoy you, Ms. Myrtle. Appreciate your uh, observations today. Have a good parent teacher conference. Yeah. It's all dependent on the, uh, um, do you want to say goodbye, Mr. Etheridge? Yeah, do you want to turn that on? I have a 130. Perfect. Have a great hearing. <laughs> They're all leaving us. They're dropping like flies. More meetings. Just what you needed. Um, 
I will say Valdez is also doing a whole heck of a lot. And I'm envious of some of their financial resources. Uh, they're throwing all the spaghetti at the wall. So that's another one. But uh, occasionally a pat on the back is good. Um, so that's, I had similar questions. I think uh, we should definitely embed uh, that into the operating budget. And I think that should be an easy sell to the rest of the assembly. So maybe that's something that we know coming out of this work session that we should recommend if I'm not seeing objection, but I'll see in a second if you do have objections to that. Um, but the other question I have related to that housing fund is I very much appreciate the Gantt chart on page 23 as my life is now a Gantt chart heavy world. Um, not that I ever wanted it to be. <laughs> and I was looking at the overall period of time with what we have now, because one of the other ideas we had talked about at the retreat was maybe we should run it twice a year um, or something that allowed for more rolling in case we're missing out on people who might be taking advantage of it. It looks like looking at this as it's set up currently is kind of like, doesn't point towards that would be a good idea based on what staff has put together here. Would, what would it take to, I guess I'll say, is that a fair characterization? Do you kind of feel like, well, when we looked at it, we don't actually think it's that great, or it may not be that feasible to run it twice. And if that is the case, what would it take to make it more feasible? Is it like more staff, is it a staff constraint or what is a constraining factor? Uh, Mr. Chamber. Sure. Uh, Madam Chair, yes, I, thanks for that question, I think. Um, so looking at the Gantt chart, obviously the first part of it is is budget related. So that really depends on the assembly. So we're waiting for that decision uh, before we can even put out the funding uh, for each year. So that seems to be uh, a kind of an assembly discussion and, and, and process takes that. For, on the side of an applicant, you know, once the dollar amount is known, their process is actually, we try to make it as tidy as possible. Uh, there's enough time, uh, any six to eight week period for the information to be out and for public comments and, and questions with applicants. Uh, and then we, we, we get through it and then and reviewed in about two months. Uh, and then it goes back to the assembly for final confirmation. So, so it means from start to finish, uh, they could have their contract in hand in, in about four months. Um, I, one of the things we did with this Gantt chart is just show all of the public process uh, uh, in the red squares. And so, you know, decreasing the time frame would mean taking a look at, you know, taking out either some of that public process or, you know, if there is a fix with the budget that it, it's not, we're still dependent on the budget. Um, and so, like, we're not going to get an infusion of a new budget for this year's housing fund in December. Uh, so we're still going to be utilizing the same funds that you allocate in, in June. Uh, and so given all the process, the steps, and then actually getting to the contracts uh, negotiation, and it, it is a pretty lengthy process, and duplicating it could get unwieldy uh, because we'd be tying up contracts with one parse while getting applications from another. And I'm not exactly sure if we have the volume of development projects that really simply can't wait uh, six more months to do it kind of in this manner. So in one of the reasons for putting the Gantt chat to chart together was to kind of show the steps and see if it was feasible. And, you know, staffing wise is, an, is a huge issue too, because Joseph would do nothing but look at housing fund applications all year long. So uh, I'm, I'm leaning to keeping it and maybe tighten it up where we can uh, uh, for uh, applicants. Um, but once a year seems to be the better option at this point. Okay, thanks. That's helpful to see that visualized. I'm just gonna go to Ms. Stream next just because it's a question about the same topic and then I'll go to Ms. Preston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, actually, maybe more of a comment, so I'm sorry, but about um, the housing fund and, and finding a revenue source for it. I, I When I read, identify a dedicated revenue source to me that's something different than putting it in the budget to be funded by general funds every year which is not a bad idea i'm not saying that but 
I guess my my thinking around this was like, is there something else out there? I think in some places, um, you know, there's fees associated with development that go into some kind of dedicated fund. And I'm not saying that we should do that because I, I don't know that we have the volume and the economics to make that work. But I guess that's, I don't know if that's what Ms. Wall was thinking when she brought this up, but when I have read that, that's what I have been thinking. Mr. Manager. Uh, so yeah, definitely some communities do like impact fees, um, you know, heavily touristed places with, uh, you know, places like Vail or Telluride that have very high end activity and can't afford any workforce housing, condominium developments pay a real impact fee that they use to get workforce housing. Um, I, th I think uh, Assemblymember Treem is, her instinct is right. I don't think we would generate very much fees and we're trying to not dampen um, developer activity. And I, I doubt that would be received very well in the development community. Some communities do a dedicated um, sales tax. Some like, you know, people will do like a quarter percent sales tax for transit you know, to fund their transit system. And then just year in, year out, the transit system gets that. You could do something like that. Um, but the, you know, the the revenues that are in our control uh, with and without the voters are property tax, sales tax, and uh, fees for development projects. And just a question, I should know the answer to this, but I'll admit my ignorance. We, with, we, reauthorize the special 1% and we tell people what we're generally thinking for that periodically, but there's no, how we use, um, if we wanted to dedicate some percentage of the normal sales tax, we could do that since it already exists without going to the voters. So, so technically, you can't dedicate it. Okay. So in Alaska, there's like a, a rule against. Yes, and as I said that, I was dedicate. like, I know this term. You're not supposed to do this. Okay. You can't dedicate it, but you can set up a, a protocol. Okay. And make it part of your annual process. Right. If we make it part of our annual process, uh, in in our budget, uh, it could identify property tax. It could identify sales tax. Okay. Uh, as you see fit. Um, but, you, but but technically, even when we put sales tax on the ballot and we say, here's what we intend to do for the next five years, there's there's nothing prohibiting the assembly from using those funds in any general purpose way that it chooses. It's, it's just that we know that if we tell the voters we're going to do something and then we do something different, the likelihood they're going to support a ballot initiative in the future uh, we believe greatly plummets. So we've always hewed ex extremely close to what we tell people in the voter guide. Great, thank you. Any other questions on A or thoughts on A, Bryson? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I really appreciate that Mr. Watt mentioned that the city was starting to become like a bank because that's an important part of this discussion. Banks wanna know two things when you're loaning money. One, do you need the money? If the answer is yes, they are not going to loan it to you. The banks will only loan you money that you don't need. Uh, the other thing that the bank wants to know is the answer of three questions. How am I getting paid back? How am I getting paid back? And how am I getting paid back? Those are the two factors when a bank is looking at things. If people have yeses to those questions, we're not going to hear from them. If they have substantial cash flow and they're doing these projects with cash, those are not the people that we are incentivizing or attracting. I've had a few conversations with some of the people that are out there developing. There, so some of the actions we're doing aren't going to benefit the folks. Who we are benefiting are the people that are trying to do more than what they financially have the capability of at that moment. Their idea and their desire their ambition is greater than their bank account that's where the city comes into play and so that way we are not stifling ingenuity and the city is encouraging that think outside the box um 
it's very easy to go to the bank and say, I have 25% down cash. I'd like to bank to finance 75%. Let's make this happen. That's a yes. And then they just move forward. We are dealing with all of the projects that are outside of that realm. And so what we're trying to do is not dissuade anybody that isn't cash heavy, but has practical, real solutions because the solutions are as important as the funding source. And so I, I was really glad that you touched on that, Mr. Watt, because we are not benefiting the cash heavy, wealthy developers. All of these project projects and programs that we're talking about here are going to be people that are taking on a bigger project than what they could capable uh, really do themselves. Oh, excuse me. That's why I think it's important to keep that component in. Um, the other part about being a bank is that profit is in the risk. So when the city absorbs some of that risk by being the financier, the city financially benefits a little bit more because we're, we're getting at least a small percentage interest rate on these loans that are revolving loans. Zero. Zero. Yeah. Even with, the, Oh, so that's what that, that other decision was. Oh, okay. So, um, well, that's not a perfect answer. Uh, however, <laughs> so what it will do, though, is allow a project to move forward that if the if the city financing affordable housing component wasn't there, that project wouldn't move forward. And so we're getting the benefit of making projects happen. Uh, so I appreciate the fact that we can be the bank when we, when needed. Yeah, our, our benefit is getting the housing, getting the economic activity, getting the local spending and getting the local uh, work yeah, lots of benefits we haven't gone into some of the other letters so i don't uh mr chumper uh, before we move on from a um i just want to talk a little bit about a11 uh so um obviously uh there's lots of incentives for kind of niche programs and for developers who are, have ideas and concepts and, and want to utilize city funds for it uh but the other piece to consider as really like uh where the city has the most influence is with public private partnerships uh if you think about the assisted living uh tory pines development project uh the city uh, basically came into a public private partnership after about 10 years of of a state in need uh and put out an rfp layered with incentives uh specifically for that purpose and so you know if the assembly wants to be even more aggressive with their incentives uh, that is the model uh, to do that. Um, Thanks, uh, Mr. Manager. And then I have a thought. Just a little like historic perspective. So we we had the um, the adv advocacy group that started working on senior housing, and they came to the assembly for like years, like five to ten years before uh, the assembly became convinced to financially participate. Uh, and then we spent several years developing our local formula, which I think is good. Uh, and it was, we acquired the property, we did tax abatement, and then we did a solicitation and that said, we have property, we have tax abatement and a grant and who can give us the best project. So having, having site control, let us do that for that senior housing project, but really it was years convincing ourselves that we should be part of um, making that happen. Thanks for that. That's helpful. I, um, I guess I will touch on kind of piggybacking on that because I don't mean to move out of a, uh, like a seems to a 11 seems to kind of flow into B, um, because you said, with the Tory Pines and with all that advocacy work, we really have this model. And I feel like for all of the work it took to get the momentum going for the senior housing, that is really seems like something if we could, I, I said, we need like a sous writer for housing. <laughs> and I just basically asked her to come back and do that for housing because she was such a, a dynamo behind that. Um, that she said no. <laughs> and um, I, I guess I'm 
I, that's what I'm extremely interested in. Or like, as far as like you said, like this is our most effective tool. If like, do you want to be more aggressive? This is how you leverage that further. So that's, and I think we're, we're all interested in that. So does that fall more under B? And I'm kind of delayed because I didn't want Mr. Bryson to miss anything. Don't worry, I just rambled. Sure, through the chair, yes. I think um, obviously it's project specific. Um, you know, basically you can use the model to target workforce housing, you know, and just say, okay, here's a little land, here's the grant amount. You already have tax abatement in place. We need somebody who's going to do uh, workforce housing smattered with four units of extremely low income housing. Uh, and to have the confidence that we've layered enough incentive in it that we're going to find a qualified developer. Uh, and so I think, you know, to start that process, I don't, you know, that you could look for real estate that is opportunistic, or you could utilize your your land that you already have. And so that leads in the in the goal B and where uh, the lands department and Mr. Blythorn, uh have things uh, kind of already in process. And there's other opportunities in that list too. And I'll jump in there too, um, just to say that, yeah, I think uh, uh, A11 ties into most of B, thinking about Telephone Hill and the opportunities there as the assembly and as the city gets uh, control of that site and we learn more about it. I think there's definitely opportunity for public-private partnerships there. And um, so I can see once we gain control of that property moving forward with something like that after we have results from some design work that's gonna be done. Where it looks like he's getting ready to uh -huh. unmute there. Hopefully, I'm telling truth. Yeah, I was just going to butt in. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Please butt in. Okay, so go, going to Telephone Hill. So we talk about it a lot. Um, so diplomatically, we're trying to figure out like how hard we put our foot on the gas. Right? It's an incredible opportunity. Um, we've got people who live up there that want to live up there as long as possible. Uh, when we started this last, you know, May or June, when we acquired the property, we were like, let's do a soft landing. And, you know, we kind of encouraged people and we we're like, uh, we don't know when we're getting the property. And I, I think help work with your other assembly members to balance that speed versus um, the amount of time that people need to move on. So we have not decided um, that people have to move out on any certain date. Um, but, you know, we had a couple of assembly members that wanted to be sure that we hadn't decided which telegraphs in the neighborhood, no hurry. Um, we are do doing an RFP and a, uh, we'll be doing a planning process this spring. Um, you know, and all development projects take a really long time. Uh, so stay focused on the timeline on that one, I think, because it could take a really long time or we could maybe move a little faster. So it's just a couple of thoughts on telephone. You know. Thanks. I'll uh, just add that Telephone Hill is like a uh, once in a lifetime opportunity for the assembly in the city. And so we are trying to proceed with caution. Yeah, we, we like we have like two acres or two or more, more than two acres, like airlifted into mixed use zoning downtown. It's kind of incredible. Agree. And yeah, I think I'll just say if it's someone who wasn't at the cow, but listened in from the East Coast that I do think we have a mix of feelings on the gas pedal on the assembly. And we want to make sure that we're sending a consistent message between committees and and reports and things, because I also know at the same time we we're saying yes, no definitive ending, then we also probably have a definitive ending in the RFP, perhaps. So I don't, I just want to make sure, I don't know, to, or, to that once in a lifetime opportunity that we, we kind of are all on the same page. Ms. Wall, I don't want to keep talking. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, but I do think there's some confusion about, you know, until Mr. Watt just spoke, I wasn't under the impression that the assembly wanting a soft landing was what was slowing down this project. I feel like we've been using soft landing as a way of saying, let's not kick people out of their homes until we're ready to build new housing. Cause we all know we don't want to get rid of housing units until we have a plan for more housing units. So maybe there's more agreement on the assembly about that. If we could all get on the same page that 
soft landing doesn't mean slowing down the project. Does that make sense? It may be a good conversation to have with the full assembly that what do we really mean by soft landing? And we'll have a consultant on board. I think they're getting scored soon. So we should have a consultant on board to do that planning process. Correct. It's well, they'll be selected early next week. And okay. We'll be in that contract phase and we will be trying to get them in front of the assembly as fast as we can to start that. Great. Thank you. Uh, do you want to say talk about other things in B? Yeah, just rolling through the concept of public private partnerships, you know, Telephone Hill is a future opportunity. And I'd say Peterson Hill is an opportunity that's happening right now, where we have these two applications that are basically going to be worked out through some type of public private partnership. And so I can see those having similar um, final purchase and sales agreements to that what we had for the um, senior living. And so we're working with the law office to try to come up with some terms and conditions. We're actively working with the housing authority. They've requested some information the city has collected over the years. You know, the city did a, did a ton of work. The assembly, we spent a, a bunch of money, even things like traffic studies and designing utilities and the, the preliminary plat. And so uh, the housing authority is looking at all that information. And as we move forward and continue to negotiate, um, that, will, that will all be part of the future negotiations as well. Okay. Thank you for that. Ms. Wall, did you have something? No, okay. And then um, I'll just continue on if there's no questions on that. So the, uh, the third piece of property that was really retreat centric was the second and Franklin parking lot, which is again, another downtown opportunity for the assembly. And so we've already kind of started to have initial discussions with the state of Alaska who owns the two-story parking garage right adjacent to this. And so in a lot of ways, it makes sense, it, you know, if, if the city could acquire and control both of those properties and do some type of consolidation, the type and style of the project can grow immensely. The, you know, the value of the, you know, the sum is greater than the two parts in that case. And so we look at that whole block side there together. So in the next few months, we're going to be working with DNR and trying to figure out how to start that process if we formally apply to acquire it through the DNR process, which will likely happen. And then also just other conversations happening at the manager level and, and and things like that that are in the works. So I'm hesitant to try to move forward with a public-private partnership until we have uh, some more concrete evidence of if the state would be willing to work with us on that lot. Do you have something to say on that, Mr. Manager? Yeah, just a little uh, little history on, on Second and Franklin. So um, we acquired the property when we traded our city department health and social services building to Jammy back in like, I don't know, 25 years ago or something, 2000. Okay. So Jammy got the property at Salmon Creek where we used to have a city department that we did health and social services. So we got that property. And at the time the assembly was very focused on parking. Uh, so we tore down the, what was it? The Odd Fellows Hall? Two buildings were on that property. Yeah. And the colonial apartments. We tore down an apartment building to make a surface <laughs> parking die. lot. I'm dying over here. Uh, well, we really did that, but okay, that's just, so they're just facts. I'll add that there's more to it, like sure. hazardous waste and. This, we, then, we then decided that it was a good candidate for housing. So we put it out and we got a developer who was interested uh, and we got hung up on um, a reconveyance agreement and it went nowhere. And we had no incentives. And it was like, we don't want to sell you this property unless you're really going to do it. So we want a hook so we can pull it back. So that, that effort failed. We went out again. We found another developer. Um, it, actually, the presentation when you... Eagle Rock. So the first one was 2000... Eagle Rock was not the, that long the, the before I got on the yeah, assembly. Yeah. yeah. 14 or 15. And then the microphone, guys, I can't hear you. Uh, 2014 or 15. Yep. The Eagle Rock was 2017 through 2019. So, so, and then Eagle Rock looked at it and they said, we, they actually did a lot of work and they said, you know, you really need to do tax abatement. Well, we've done that. You really need to do parking and we've done that. And you really need to add money. And at the time, those were all bridges too far for the assembly. So we're kind of back to it. Um, we could put Second and Franklin out as it is today uh, under the senior housing model and just get the best project. Uh, as Mr. Blyderen said, we reached out to the state 
um, and we talked to two acting division directors and the deputy commissioner of transportation and you know they've got their hands full and they're kind of like what you want a piece of state property that we manage and the governor's office parks there and we we basically said look we will do run and fetch it on anything you want um to try and figure out how to get that property and provide you parking somewhere else and it, it's just going to be a slow road working with the state it is a much better potential so our property with the state garage i mean you're talking the footprint of the baronoff hotel um our property alone you can do a project it's just not going to be uh as as good so yeah that's exactly what i one of the questions i had so like magnitude of scale like could you i mean that's helpful when you say baronoff but like a guess between difference in unit sizes like are we talking 10 units versus i don't know dude i'm not a unit estimator and i'm not a developer uh, miss cole you have a guess thank you <laughs> um you know i don't have a guess as to units but i think the more pertinent discussion from number of units is is who how you're capping the cost if if you if you want a private developer to develop something the best bang for their buck is luxury condos right like they're going to they're going to have expensive condos because that's what they get the most return on so if in these rfps you really are you really want workforce housing then you're going to have to stipulate that and that is going to look different in the pro forma than those luxury condos and so partly it's it's an issue not so much of even how many but like what kind and the terms are different depending on what kind thanks that's uh that is worth back of the mind thinking but uh do any staff have a i, st I still want someone to guess <laughs> scott so, uh backing off miss up uh, miss cole's uh thoughts um if you think back to eagle rock ventures they are a private company and their original intention was to do fair market uh housing based on a workforce model which meant micro housing so efficiencies in in one bedrooms tops uh, but in order for them to uh, charge affordable housing rate, which they wanted to charge in the 900 range, because it, it fits with their model, and that's the clientele they wanted, um, they needed, uh, without incentives, their pro forma showed $1,600 a month in rent. So they needed upfront with tax abatement, parking reduction, and grant to cover that almost $600 a month you know, for you know, you know, 20 years. Uh, and they weren't able to get there with that model. They also went ahead, and that was a, a potentially 80 to 100 unit project. Uh, and when that wasn't penciling out and uh, the incentives obviously were not going to come online very quickly, they went ahead and looked at a more affordable model and looked at a low income housing tax credit, which would have been uh, slightly low, capped rents, 60 units tops, because that's what the tax credit program kind of perceived as the max allowable for our region. Uh, and so again, that didn't pencil out for them. So then they they went away without incentives. Thanks for that. Yeah, I, I, I'll i just offer it that, oh, sorry. I'll just, go ahead. You got the footprint. I was just gonna jump You're the engineer the units. Yeah, so please. The city property is about 12,000 square feet. The state property is maybe about 8,000 square feet. Um, it's high density zoning. Uh, you, I don't think there's a height restriction there. Uh, a lot of units. We're not not ten to twelve. I mean, it's uh, MU, yeah. Uh, unlimited. Un unlimited, unlimited height, unlimited units. So as so as high as you can practically build, and as high as you can practically get permitted, right? Because you're going to twenty stories, neighborhood issues, and view planes. But it it's the most stories. generous zoning district. Um, Too bad. But you might be able to get 100 units on the lot as it exists today, but with the state, you know, a, a lot of units. Um, can I just add a comment that reminds me, just going back to Telephone Hill, I'll just also state that Telephone Hill is the same zoning. So thank you. Throw that out there. That's helpful. Um, oh, I'm, I just lost my thought. Oh, I just want to say, uh, team, no blanket. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a team wet blanket, team set wet blanket on fire, lovingly. Um, 
I, that's why I was asking about like the orders of magnitude, because I don't want us to be short-sighted and say, we have like a little wood built three story versus when we could have like a huge apartment building when we need so many units, we're so behind on units. Um, so I don't want to be short-sighted and I get that we're planning for the, you know, Juno in perpetuity is our model and, you know, a town in perpetuity. So I don't want to be too short-sighted. However, with Telephone Hill, which is a different process that almost by state standards, I could be wrong, but I would think would be a little bit faster tracked knowing what it's, how the vacancy rates at the state and knowing how much they have their hands full of something else. I think we're potentially talking about a very long time to get that other piece of property for them. So we have, I just think we should have to balance that with the fact that we are in an active crisis um, and we are losing families, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I would almost be inclined to see what we could do with our own property and, and take that out to market as well. Carol Cheem has a question as well. Assembly Member Cheem has a question. Uh, thanks. I, I appreciate those comments, Alicia. Um, and this question for staff. So between Telephone Hill, if you were to, do we need to prioritize, I guess, between like focusing on Telephone Hill versus uh, Second and Franklin, or is it worth exploring both at the same time? I'll jump in there. I think they're on two different paths. So Telephone Hill is on a path. We're going to have a planning consultant. We're going to have a public process. Um, Second and Franklin, you could just decide, right? And we would, Joseph would be resuscitating the senior housing RFP and kind of changing it to Second and Franklin. You know, there obviously would have to be some public process. Um, the last time, or the last two times that we talked about Second and Franklin, there was pushback from the neighborhood. So they're going to want the opportunity to say, why are you picking this property? Um, and the, usually the best answer to that is we've looked at all our properties and this is the, this is the best one, but um, it is, it is ready for work. Thanks, uh, Carol. Sorry, I didn't see your hand. No worries. Um, I, I think I feel differently than you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's okay. The, the parking lot there, I think, is a is a totally different animal than Telephone Hill was in terms of acquiring it from the state. And also, uh, Mr. Manager may disagree with me on this, but I'm pretty sure I made him promise we could he would get that property for us before he retired. So he's got quite the incentive to make that happen. But um, I, I think the glasses that, are oh, off. The glasses came off. I can see glasses it. are <laughs> off. I just wanted you to know. <laughs> um, that's to say, I, I think it's a different different process in Telephone Hill. I the state has you know their own things going on. It's not going to be immediately, but I I don't. I think it's important to wait. I think it just makes the the potential for that corner there just so much greater if we could combine those two and I think that we did eliminate parking requirements in on that block but I think that a developer would probably want to provide some parking just you know that's what the market would demand is if the developer provided some parking and if uh if we're limited to the second and Franklin lot I think that kind of hampers what interest we might get. So I would say um, let's wait until we get that other piece. And then I also think in terms of what goes there, if it's luxury condos, if we write in that it's got to be something else, um, I, I think we can wait on that discussion until we're actually ready to move forward on that. Thanks for that, Ms. Dream. Very uh, super valid. That's why I said it's it's a nuanced conversation. We have comment from Mr. Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to uh, note that I too recall that firm agreement that the manager made between Assembly Member Dream about acquiring that piece of property <laughs> uh, before a certain date. So that's uh, just nice. just wanted to note that for the record. Thank you for putting that on the record. Well, if Mr. Manager gets it before he retires, then I could be easily swayed. <laughs> 
Uh, we do not make it through all of our list where basically we started 15 minutes slate, but I also know that we only said we we're going till two and it's a work day. So I don't know. I'm looking around the table to see. How about we do this again? We have another one. Uh, Mr. Manager. I, I've got to run, but I, I mean, I, I would, I'm looking at you. I think this is a really good process for us. And, I do too. I would be really happy to do this again next month. Great. Um, I'm getting thumbs up all around. And Madam Chair, I think we were going to also, and maybe next month would be the time, rework maybe the pri the priorities and see so that the planning commission knows exactly what to tackle after the, the substantively completed ones are done. So that would be helpful for us next month, for sure. <laughs> Okay, great. Yeah, we can make sure that happens. Yeah, I think this is a great process. So if, if we want to revisit this next month, um, if that works for staff, then anything else, uh, Mr. Blydorn, to do you have other thoughts? Um, not at this time, Madam Chair. I'll work with you and the city clerk to try to schedule another time for us to reconvene and continue these discussions. I really do, as staff, really, really do appreciate the time and the energy. Uh, from this committee and liaisons and everybody involved. It's very helpful to receive this type of direction. Great. Uh, Mr. Bar uh, Bryson. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to say that uh, this was uh, so inspirational that we have uh, tentative plans for uh, trash discussion uh, in a similar uh, fashion through the public works and facilities. And uh, those dates are to be determined, but that we're going to do a similar setting uh, to trying to get the same information or the same conversation going on about trash. And then we also have a town hall for the North Douglas Crossing on March 2nd that uh, public works and facilities will be hosting. So uh, citizens have their opportunity to comment on everything the assembly is doing. So thank you for that. Great. That sounds good. Well, uh, there's nothing else to come before the Lands Housing Economic <laughs> committee then uh we're so adjourned <laughs> i was looking for the gavel <laughs>